Um, last week, we had the awesome privilege of driving. Well, we flew to California, and we picked up Destiny and her dog. And I was listening to the podcast, and Pastor Tim said, I guarantee you Pastor Greg's going to have a dog story when he gets home. And so we drove 50 hours in the car with a golden retriever dog. And rather than have a long story, I just want to show you my trip home. Enough said, right? Fifty hours. <laughs> Amen. In the Lord, good everybody. Amen. I might as well get this jacket off because I know I'm not going to be able to take that very long. So praise God. Amen. You got your Bibles? Uh, let's go to. Um, let's get into Romans chapter eight. And let's go to Romans chapter eight. And let, let me just share with you, Jesus taught 12 disciples, and those 12 disciples turned the world upside down. You're reading John 16, and he, he, he begins talking about, these are they that turned the world upside down. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't because of the number of people, it was the touch, the encounter. The encounter that they had with Jesus changed their lives forever. They didn't do life the same. Many of them were fishermen and tax collectors, and, and they, were, they, 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 they were doctors, and, and, and they were people that Jesus touched, and, and all of a sudden, everything changed in their lives. And they turned the world upside down. I believe somebody's going to get a touch from God today. I believe somebody watching the podcast or somebody sitting in the service that more than just attending a church service, more than hearing a sermon, I believe God's going to speak to your heart about an encounter with the Holy Spirit. That one encounter with Jesus can turn your life around. And many people will be taught in churches all over the city today. And we're all preaching from the same Bible, many different translations, the Amplified, the new uh, NIV, the King James. I preach out of the New King James. And, and, and we're teaching out of the same Bible. And many people are going to be taught. But a few people are going to get touched. And you have to make the decision, are you going to be taught or touched? Because it's important to be taught. And it's important to study the Word of God. But the, we are spirit and life. We are spirit and truth. And if you just have the truth and you don't have the spirit, if you don't allow the spirit of God to touch your life, it's just an event that you are having. And today I want to remind you that there is no spiritual life without the river. There's no spiritual life without the river. Going to church is amazing. Having a great worship team is amazing. Singing great songs and, 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 and being a part of, of, of a, a worship singer encountering God is amazing. I'm telling you, Michelle encountered the Holy Spirit today while he was singing. He was so sick in the first service, he could barely stand here. But I'm telling you, as he began to minister the, the word of the Lord through song, the healing power of God came over him, and he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I love watching it. In the first service, uh, the, the quartet was singing, and Paul was singing his verse. And as he began to sing his verse, we were sitting right there, and tears began to stream down his face. And I thought, how cool is that? He's singing an up song, a joyous song, but tears were streaming down his face. Why? Because he left this place and entered into the river. He entered into the river, and as he was pouring out, out of his belly was flowing rivers of living water. I'm not talking about tears. That's a sign. That's, that's one area of it. But there's so much more than just a tear. There's an experience for the body of Christ that says there's so much more. Having a great worship team is amazing. Having a great sermon is amazing. But, in have, but having an encounter with the Holy Spirit, Rich, changes everything. It just changes everything. When you encounter Him, everything in your life begins to change. <laughs> you can't do business the same anymore. You can't talk to people the same anymore. You can't respond to people the same anymore. Because when you encounter the Holy Spirit, everything changes inside of you. And there's an, uh, there's an undescribable peace that comes over your life. And I don't think I did a good job getting this over to the people in the first service. I mean, I pray I did. God will get it done. I, all I can do is present it. But I know in my heart like the, that I want you to get this message, this message, not this sermon, this message, that God has more for you. 
So many people think they've encountered him because of the experience that they're having. And I'm here to tell you, there is a river of God. A gully, you know what a gully washer is? Like there's a gully washer that will come over your spirit that transforms your life, renews your mind, and causes you to live in another place. It causes you to live in another place. You are in this world, but you're not of this world. You have another kingdom that you operate in. You draw from a different well. You're not drinking from the well of bitterness. It's the well of joy. It's the well of peace. It's the wellspring of life that comes from Jesus Christ. When you encounter him, everything in your life changes. When Jesus left this earth, when he was crucified, resurrected from the dead, and he came and he walked amongst the people, then the Bible says he ascended to the Father. Look with me, Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. What should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us? How shall we not with him freely give all things? That's an important part of this verse. How can we freely not give him all things? Why would we just give God a part of our lives? Why not just jump all the way into the river and trust that the river of God will move you and do through you what he wants to do? He did not spare his own son, delivered him up for all of us. How shall shall he not uh, with him freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is God. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen. Now, if you can, highlight it on your phone or wherever you're studying. If you've got your Bible, mark it, underline it. Okay? Who, he who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. Underline that part. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Who is it speaking about? Open book test. Who's he speaking about? Jesus. Where is he at? Right hand of God. He's in heaven at the right hand of God. And what is he doing? Making intercession for us. Interceding for us. Being a a intermediate between us and God. He's making intercession for us. Go to Hebrews chapter 8 now. We're going to go back to Romans 8 in a few minutes, but go back to, go to Hebrews chapter 8. Now, this is the main point of the things that we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Underline it. Where is he at? Where is Jesus? In heaven, on the right hand side of the throne, with God. If you're going to have an encounter with Jesus, you can only have an encounter with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. He is at the right hand of God with the Father. And he says to you and me, come on, I want you to encounter me. You cannot encounter him without the Holy Spirit. And we need to stop being afraid of the Holy Spirit. He's not your weird uncle that you're afraid to introduce everybody to and you're like, Eh, you know what, come on to the reunion, but my Uncle Joe, just watch out for Uncle Joe, he ain't all there. That's not who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the one that enables you to get to Jesus. When you encounter the Holy Spirit, you encounter Jesus and the Father. Look here, go to 1 John 2 and 1. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Then there's a comma, and it says, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our advocate. In other words, he's someone working on your behalf. He's in heaven. And the only way to experience him is through the Holy Spirit, through jumping in the river. And he himself is, our propi- is the propitiation. Now that's a big word and that's like, you know, it's a religious term that some of you pray, probably don't even know what it means, but it means atonement or price paid. Jesus is the atonement. He is the perfect Passover lamb. He, he is the one that took our place. I should have died. 
many times. <laughs> you know, I should be, I, 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 I should, I'm the least, Paul said, I'm the least of all. You know, I, I should be the least of all. I'm the chiefest of sinners. Let me tell you, that's me. But God said, no, I am your propitiation, or I am the atonement for you. I am the price paid for you, and now you have access to the Holy Spirit because of what I have done in your life. This means that you and I have access to divine favor through the Holy Spirit. I can live in divine favor. Even when things don't seem to be going my way, even when there's a lot of chaos and drama in my life, I have the power, I have the access through Jesus Christ to now access the river of God and move beyond my circumstances into a place of divine favor. God says, this is available to everyone. And so many of us, we accept Jesus and we think, that's it. And my sins are forgiven and I get to go to heaven. And you do. Pin a rose on your nose, as Jeannie would say. That's beautiful. But there's so much more. There's so much more that's available when you go all in with God and you say, God, I trust you with my life. My future, my plans, I want to be a basketball player. I want to be a, a volleyball player. I want to be a track star or a cheerleader. I want to be a businessman or I want to be a, 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 a government leader. Well, guess what? All those things are wonderful and they are all achievable through the Holy Spirit. There's nothing you cannot do or cannot accomplish if you would stop spectating and start participating in the power of the Holy Spirit. The river is the key to spiritual life. Now I'm going to get to my text. That's the introduction in John chapter 7 and verse 37. This is what the Bible says. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That word heart is the, root, is, is the Greek word koalia, and it means the innermost part of a man, the soul of a man. Out of the innermost parts of your life will flow a river, a river of God, of living water. He explains it in verse 39. He spoke this concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not been glorified. Jesus was comparing the Holy Spirit to a river. And why would he compare it to a river? Why was he, he trying to get them to understand a river? It's because a river is moving. It's changing us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things are becoming new. And what I'm here to proclaim to Destiny Church and the world through a podcast is God wants to move you into the river of God and allow things to be moved out of your life that don't belong. In John 16 and verse 7, I'm doing a lot of scripture today, but it's because I want you to understand the flow, and there's a lot of new people that may not get it, so I, want, I just want to explain it the best I can. John 16, 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. We already looked at Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and he said, Now I'm giving you an advantage. You have an advantage over every other business leader. You have an advantage over every other marriage. You have an advantage over every other father. What is the advantage? It's the Holy Spirit of God. And when you jump in the river of God, the Holy Spirit of God will move you into the places that he wants you to be in. If I depart from him, I'll send him to you. Verse number 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them right now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you. He'll guide you. He'll move you. He will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he, hears, whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take care of what is mine and declare it to you. Listen, the river leads us. The river guides us. 
The river constrains us. The river gives us life. If you're not in the current or the moving of the Holy Spirit, we are not going to experience all that God has intended for us. This is why I felt like I didn't get it over to the, in the first service. And I, and I just want to pause and just say, look, there's, everybody's from different backgrounds and different experiences. Most everybody in the room is here because you're in love with Jesus. I mean, you just love Jesus and you want more of Jesus. And here's the thing. The sad thing is most of us believe we've already got all we can get. Not, not, not in the sense of, uh, 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 of, you know, we know there's so much more yet to come. But we think that our experience with God is it. Like we've had this experience. We got saved. We've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What more could there be? And I'm here to tell you there is so much more. There's so much more. When you have an encounter with Jesus, when you are at his altar or at, 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 your, at your house and all of a sudden the worship is going and all of a sudden the glory of God comes into your life and you can't contain yourself anymore and the power of God comes over you, it's this encounter that changes everything. And I want the church to know you can encounter the Holy Spirit and he desires to encounter you. He desires to be so close to you that when you ask God for little things, he hears you. He hears you, and, and you can just ask for the simplest of things, and God says, no, I got you. I got you, because, you know, when we were in that secret place, I saw this in your life. When you and I were in that place of worship, and I was encountering you, I felt your pain, and I know exactly what you need, and before you even ask me, I'm going to make a way for you, and I'm going to bring it into your life, because I know what you have need of before you even ask. And this is the thing I want to get into our hearts. Everybody in this room, you can't go long without an encounter. If you do, you get religious. If you do, if you just come to church and you are a good person and you give money to the homeless guy at the end of the exit and, and you do good things for people and all that stuff and you're just going through the motions, praise God, I'm glad you are. I'm glad you're not the other way. I'm glad you're not mean and nasty and, and angry all the time. I'm glad you got that, but I'm just telling you, there's more, Eric. There's so much more for us. If we would jump in the river and say, God, just begin to move me. Just begin to change me. Begin to transform my life. And uh, I, being transformed by the renewing of my mind. It's real. And if it's a real river, there's a current. And when you jump in the river, you don't go where you want to go. You may look at the other side and say, I'm going to jump in the river, I'm going to go to the other side. And time you get to the other side, you're going to be way down here. And some of us, it's, oh, I just can't, I can't give up that control of my life. How could I give up the control of my business? I've got it this far. I'm just going to trust God. Absolutely trust God. Our God is a God of increase, not a God of decrease. And if you'll trust God, you will move to heights and depths that you've never experienced in your life. God wants to take you deeper. It's real, and if it's a real river, it's got a current, and if you jump in, the river will take you where it wants you to go, and it will always pull you, it will always constrain you, and it will always guide you. And if you don't feel a constraining in your life, if you don't feel a guiding of the Lord, if you, if you, don't, if you, don't, if you don't feel that leading of the Holy Spirit, then I challenge whether you're in the river or not. How do you know if you're in the river? Well, I'll tell you one way I know I'm in the river. When I'm in the river and I get challenged to do something that's wrong, there's a big no that comes up in my spirit. No, don't do that. I'm like, I'm going to just tell them what I think. Like, no. It's like this big no. And if you're not hearing the big no, and you're feeling guilty because of what you've been doing, and it's like, you, listen, if you're in the river, you'll get a big no, or you'll get a big yes, go do that. If you're in the river, even if you do wrong, the river will move you to the cross. Huh? Look here, I, I'm, I, I'm going to be the first to tell you, I don't do it right all the time. I got a call two days ago from Peter. Peter's in the hospital. He's got, he's got a bad infection in his knee. Those of you that come to the men's group on Thursday nights, you know Peter because he comes almost every Thursday. He's got a bad infection in his knee. It got, he had a knee replacement. This is crazy. When we did the picnic on the promised land, uh, uh, on the new property, when, Palm Sunday, 
Well, the week before that, I had all the guys out there with weed eaters. He got in a bunch of poison ivy, got poison ivy all up his arm. He's real allergic to poison ivy. Broke out in blisters like bad. A couple days, couldn't even walk. It was just so eat up. Well, that infection moved into that. He had a re knee replacement, a plastic knee replacement, and moved into his knee. And then it gets, the bacteria gets inside the knee thing, and no matter what antibiotics give you, it hides itself in that knee. So now he's, he just had surgery this morning to take the knee out and put a new knee in. And it's like he called me two days ago. He said, Pastor, I'm in the hospital, and I don't know if you have time to come see me. I'm like, oh, I'll be there. I'll be there. Lo and behold, Friday goes by. I, I'm consumed. It's midnight. I'm laying in bed thinking, oh, man, I forgot to go see Peter. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to see, go see Peter. First thing in the morning, go, go see Peter. All day long, I just stayed busy all day long, totally forgot. And now, it's, it, it, it's a total innocence, but at 10 o'clock last night, I'm sitting there, and I get a text from Peter. Said, Pastor, I know you're busy, but I just wanted you to pray for me. I'm going in for surgery tomorrow. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I got out of bed, drove up to the hospital, and got in there. I got him on the phone as I'm talking to him, and, tell him, and he didn't even know I'm coming. So I opened the door. I'm sitting there talking to him. He goes, what are you doing here? It, it's like, I miss it, too. I miss it, too. You're going to miss it. But, it, but when you're in the river, the river of God will move you to make it right. I'm just telling you, there's more for everybody in this room. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is here bidding you, invite me into your life. Wake up in the morning and invite me in. Stop making decisions based on your flesh. Stop letting your mind tell you what you're going to do and allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak into your mind whispers that will give you divine success in your life. One idea can change your life forever. Come on. One concept, one thought can enter your life and change your life forever. One thing can change your marriage. The river pulls you back to the cross. and We all have access. God says jump in jump into the river. The real you, the born again you, is a spirit living in a body. You're a spirit man. When you got saved your spirit came alive. You're not a fleshly person with a spirit. You're a spirit that has flesh. And You, when you get in the river you allow the spirit of God to control you and move you. Look at Romans 8. Go back to Romans chapter 8. In verse number 5. The Apostle Paul is teaching, and he says, hey, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those that live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. <laughs> we got to be after the Spirit, folks. You need to be pursuing the Spirit. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. You want access to Jesus? It's through the Spirit. You, you allow it, and he's a gentleman. He's not forcing himself on anybody, but he says, I'm available to everybody. There are no hoops to jump through. You don't have to, you don't have to get everything in order and then, then get filled with the Holy Spirit. You can get filled with the Holy Spirit this morning. All you have to do is invite him in. Listen, speaking in tongues does not mean you're full of the Holy Spirit. It is the initial evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you can speak in tongues all day long and not have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And you're deceiving yourself thinking you're full of the Holy Spirit when all you have is a prayer language. I'm just telling you, everybody gets access to the Holy Spirit. And it's up to you to wake up and fill your life with the Holy Spirit. You begin to read the Word, meditate on the Word, meditate on the Word day and night. You begin to make your way prosperous. You begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. There's a strength and a significance to praying in tongues. And there's also a strength and significance to walking in the Holy Spirit and allowing the fruit of the Holy Spirit to come out of your life. Love, joy, peace, goodness, patience endurance now, come on these are all fruits of the spirit and so if you're full of the holy spirit those fruits are flowing out of your life and if they're not flowing out of your life if you find yourself angry all the time mad all the time depressed all the time thinking the wrong thoughts all the time d d discouraged and defeated then you're not in the river you need to jump in the river and allow the river to wash over you and cleanse you and cause you to have fruit of the holy spirit flowing out of your life if you believe that I give the Lord a praise. Amen. We need to be after the Spirit, after the Spirit, chasing after the Holy Spirit. Say, God, fill me up today. 
He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He won't. But let me tell you something. There, there is a process of being full of the Holy Spirit. When the river of God comes into your life, it begins to erode away the soil. The river of God begins to move the flesh out. He begins to wash you out. There's a cleansing. When you come to Jesus and you ask him to forgive you of your sins, he forgives you of every sin. And then the river begins to wash you and cleanse you and move things out. And if you refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse you and wash you, if you hold on to bitterness and you hold on to unforgiveness, if you hold on to hard things in your life and say, well, this is just too hard. You don't know, Pastor. I was abused, so I'm going to hold on to that abuse because I hate the man that abused me. And God says, you know what? If you stay there, if you stay in that place as the river of God hits that hard place repeatedly time and time again and you refuse to move those things and remove those things the Holy Spirit of God the river of God will shift around you God will always be drawing you he will never leave you but I'm telling you right now the Holy Spirit of God if you ever look at a river what's a river do it winds it curves it starts off with this straight flow and it's flowing and it's fast and it's moving and the streams are coming out of the mountains and the snow is melting and the water's going and the river is rushing and it's going in a straight path but then as it begins to erode the soil and wash the things out it comes up against these hard places these fixed positions and you will not stop the river of God the river of God will continue to move and it'll look for, it'll move around and it'll shift itself around the hard places. I want to be a man that is after the Spirit of God. I got to be a husband that is after the Spirit of God. I can't rest on what we've done up until this point. I mean, I got 32 years in marriage and, and I just determined in my life if I'm not working on my marriage, I'm working on my divorce. You better get that into your spirit and stop taking advantage of your wife and thinking she's always going to be there and everything's always going to be peachy. You have, a ob you, you, have, you have an obligation of the Father, the Holy Spirit, to begin to work. I'm going to be a man that's after the Spirit of God. I, my, my children are all grown. Destiny's 19 years old, getting ready to get married to Josiah in February, and it's amazing. My son is 29 years old, but I want you to know something. I'm still working on being a better father. I've already raised them. I've already trained them. I've done everything I can do for them, Bill. And now I'm mentoring for them what it looks like to be a real man of God. Now I'm setting a pattern in my life to say, son, what I've taught you, I'm living. But listen, I, I got to be a man that's after God. I got to be a father that's after the Spirit of God. Because even in me, as the Holy Spirit is washing me and cleansing me and he's changing my flesh, there are places that he reveals and exposes to me. David said, Lord, reveal to me the hidden sins of my heart. And as God washes you and the Holy Spirit river of God cleanses you, he comes into your life and he begins to see things and expose things. And you have the responsibility to say, look, I'm either going to clean this stuff out of my life or the river of God's going to move and shift. I want to be a pastor that's after the Spirit of God. That's after the Spirit of God. I don't want to be a church that preaches great sermons and has great, great worship teams and has a great performance. I want to be a church that's after the Spirit of the living God. That's hearing the heartbeat of God for a city. Come on. We got great pastors in our city. We have great churches in our city. And I want to pray and this begin. I want to be a pastor that blesses the other churches and prays for the other pastors. This is what Moses said. Moses, Moses was so governed by the Holy Spirit spiritually. He was just so governed. In Exodus chapter 33, in verse number 2, Moses said to the Lord, You say to me, bring these people up, but you've not let me know whom you'll send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found grace in my sight. This is God, this is what Moses said. This is what you said to me. You know me by name, and I found grace in your sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me now the way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider this nation as your people. And he said, God said to him, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses was so governed by the Holy Spirit in verse 15. Moses said to God, then Moses said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, nor do you bring us up from here. I mean, if you're not going with me, I'm not going. He was so sensitive to the river of God. He said, look it, I refuse to do this in my flesh. 
I refuse to try to lead these people on my own. He was so convinced, God, if you're not going, I'm not going. And we as a church sometimes get so governed by our programs and our systems and, and having the kids' church just right and everything is just in order that we've lost the presence of God. And God's saying, jump in the river. Just jump in the river. In, in Psalm 51, David said this, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David knew that everything could change in a minute if he got hardness of the heart. I don't want to follow the flesh. I need the current of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 12, back to Romans 8. I love Romans 8. I think that could be the Bible just right there, Romans 8. I could just read that. It's like so amazing. Everything's there. Romans 8 and verse 12, he said, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, but to, not to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if you live and you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. For as many are led, think about the river, for as many are led, who are many are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. Is the Holy Spirit leading you? Is he guiding you? Is he welcome to speak into your life? The Passion Translation, which is a great translation of the Bible, says this, the mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Think of the river. They're moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Mature children of God jump in the river. Galatians 3 and 3 says this, Are you foolish? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that, you're, that, that you are now being made perfect by the flesh? You're going to do church in the flesh? You're going to do your relationship with God in the flesh? You're going to go through the routines and the rituals and do all the things and say the right things, stand up, sit down, do all the right things and think that's it? There's so much more. God's desire for your life is that you jump in the river. God's desire for your business is that you do business in the river. His desire for his church is that his church would jump in the river. Why? Because the river is moving. It has current. It moves and it shifts. Refuse to let the river leave your marriage. Refuse to let the river leave your life. Refuse to let the river leave your business. If you don't stay in the water, you're going to spiritually die. As we traveled across the country coming from California, most major cities in the United States of America are built around a river. There's a river either flowing through it or around it. And they built rivers by the city because there's life in the river. And I'm telling you, there's life in the Holy Spirit. If the river shifts and leaves you, everything in your life will dry up. Everything in your life will dry up. You'll become joyless. Huh? You'll become lifeless. You ever wonder what makes a river change? I looked it up, and here's a couple things. Here's two things that I found that makes a river change direction. When a river hits a hard place that will not move, the river will move to the place of least resistance. When a river hits a hard place in your life, the river will move to the place of least resistance. Second thing is this. When there's a buildup of debris over time, it'll cause a river to change directions. You ever see them out there with a barge, cleaning out all that soot, cleaning out all that, that mess? Why? Because they know if the river leaves our city, the city's going to die. What, 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 what things is God washing away in your life? Is the Lord washing away lust out of your heart? Is he washing away lust out of your heart? Are you still holding on to that? Is the river cleaning up your mouth? You've been saved for a while now. Are you still cussing? <laughs> so simple. It's, it's, so, it's so crazy. Well, that's an old habit. It just comes out of me every now and then. It's a hard place that the river's trying to wash out of you. You ought to be different in the kingdom of God. We ought to do life differently. We ought not get mad the way we used to get mad. You still living with a negative attitude? Is everything dark? Is everything gloomy? Is everything going in the wrong direction? I just meet people. Everything's bad. Everything. How you doing? Oh, that's just terrible, man. Everything's falling apart. The dog pooped in the yard. I got stuff going everywhere. It's like, I can't even. Are you serious? It's like you're just living with a negative attitude. There are people like that. You know, man, it's probably some of you. Just a negative attitude. Do you still talk about what 
what's wrong more than you talk about what's right? Man, that's what kept the people of, uh, of God in the wilderness. Because they just grumbled and complained. And well, we, at least back there we had leeks and we had garlic. We could just go back to that. So come on, it, it, the river ought to be changing the way we do life. The way we're responding. If you don't let the river, river wash your flesh, the river will move and you'll be spiritually weak wondering what in the world happened. You're either going after the flesh or going after the spirit. Jesus said this, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. In the 80s, we, uh, we traveled to Haiti and uh, shortly after that we started an orphanage there because my heart got connected to the children of Haiti. We were going village to village and praying with people and someone had told us about a little village called 87. And uh, I was like, well, tomorrow could we go there? Can we just go there? He said, yeah, when you go, you need to take water because they don't have water. And uh, 87 is 87 kilometers from Port-au-Prince. So our orphanage is maybe just about a mile from 87. So we go through a little village called 81 and a little village called 87. When we got back to village 87, what I found was a lot of old bulldozers, um, backhoes, big trucks, all broke down. And there's a community of about 150 people living in these metal um, sheds and, and, um, and car, uh, train cars. And uh, so when we got there, we just, we come and, and all the people gathered around us and we began to pray with them and do church with them. And I fell in love with Village 87. And, and what I come to find out was back in the 70s and in, in, in way back years and years ago, it was a prosperous little town. So prosperous that there was actual train tracks that ran to that village to pick up rope. They made rope in this village. And it was the most successful village. And they brought bulldozers. They brought backhoes. All this machinery came to this little village. But over time, they used up all the plants that produced the rope, that produced the, 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 the vine that made the rope. And they would just cut them down and take them, and they were sending them all out. And eventually, they used up all the plants, and the trains left. And they left the train tracks there, and all the machinery, and all that stuff was just left there. But the people refused to move. Th th this is Village 87. And, and they lived in those little huts. These are just little metal, metal buildings. And each one of those buildings could be 14 or 15 people living in those little, little huts. And I remember Bill going there, and these little children, we made balloons, and these little children were all playing. And I, I went into one of those little huts, and uh, there was a little baby in there, and it was eating. And I, was, I, I went over to the little child, Bill, and I said, hey, hey, I told the interpreter, ask him, can I pray with him? And he took out, he had a mouse that he had caught. This is how poor and destitute this place had become. In the very back, t show the next picture, the machinery. In, in the, way back in the back on the right-hand side is a little hut. And inside that little hut, it became a little infirmary where they would take all the sick and put them back there. And when they would get malaria and diseases, they would put all the people in that little sick place. And when I came to the village to preach, I said, hey, um, is there anybody I could pray with? Is there anybody sick? And they, they began to tell me back in, back in the back, all our sick people are back there. And I went behind that hut, and there was an old man laying with a petrified leg. It was swollen so big I couldn't put my arms around it. And there was heat. It was so hot. And he was just laying there waiting to die. In one of the most prosperous villages close to St. Mark, they refused to adjust their life. They didn't own that land. They were just squatters there. But they refused to move. When everything changed, they stayed the same. I'm here to tell you there are so many people in this room. We're just Christian folks, and we're just staying the same. And God said, you should never stay the same. Huh? You should be constantly changing. There ought to be things that the river is exposing because of the flesh that's being washed out of your life. And there ought to be a transfer. There ought to be a transformation of your life. You ought not look the same next week as you did this week. There ought to be some joy in your life that wasn't there yesterday. That now, because of an encounter with the Holy Spirit, you're now walking in the joy of the Lord. And it doesn't matter the circumstance. 
You cannot stay under the circumstances. You got to come above it and say, hey, I, my God is above and not beneath. He is the head and not the tail. He is the, he is the blesser of all things, and I walk and live in divine favor. It's an encounter, and it's available for each and every one of us. The most beautiful people in the world refused to follow the river, and they were dying in a dry place. Listen to me, the addiction's going to kill you. Stop babysitting that addiction. You don't have to be addicted. You don't have to smoke weed every day to get high to remove the pain. Come on, you don't have to have a glass of wine every day to calm you down. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Well, I got to take this pill so I can sleep. No, the Bible says he would bless you with sweet sleep. Come on, there's a scripture for every addiction. You don't have to be, if you keep allowing that hard place to stay in your life and you refuse to move it, the river's going to move, guys. The river's going to move and you're going to have a little churchy experience every week where you just show up and, oh, it felt so good. I'm telling you, no, there's a transformation for your life. God wants to take you to the streets. God wants you laying hands on sick people and watching them recover. God wants you speaking the voice of truth in your schools and telling your, your, your schoolmates, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. My daughter was six years old and went to the school and went into the kindergarten, the first grade classroom, and a little girl came up to her and Desi said, if you want to go to heaven, you got to give your life to Jesus. You want to go to heaven? She said, yes, I want to go to heaven. Desi said, you need to pray and ask Jesus in your heart. At six years old, the father called me on the phone, got my number from my wife at school. When De Bobby was picking up Destiny, the father comes over and says, hey, I'm picking up my daughter. But yesterday, my daughter came home and told us that your daughter asked her to pray and ask Jesus in her heart. I, I, I don't even know what that means, but my daughter was so happy. And she asked my wife, are we going to heaven? And she said, yes, we're going to heaven. She, she said, well, then we need to ask Jesus into our heart. He said, I want to come to your church next week. Could, could we come to your church? And Rick, Rick and Christine Holloway came to our church and that Sunday lifted their hands and accepted Jesus Christ. Don't tell me God can't use you in your schools. Don't tell me God can't use you right where you're at. Everybody in this room has access to an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And when you encounter him, it changes everything. It brings so much peace into your life. It's available. Jump in the river. Jump in the river. Amen. We all need to be washed in the river. Ezekiel describes the river like this in Ezekiel 47, verse number 1. Miss Gail, if you'd come to the keyboard. Ezekiel has this vision. He's seeing this. It's real for him. He has this vision. He said, he brought me to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. There ought to be a river flowing out of this church. Amen. Come on, there ought to be a river flowing out of this church to the neighbors. There ought to be a river flowing out of this church to our government leaders. There ought to be a river flowing out of our lives to those who are closest to us. And there was a water flowing from under the threshold of the, the temple towards the east. For the front of the temple faced the east. The water was flowing under the right side of the temple south of the altar. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate. And he led me around the outside of the outer gateway that faces the east. And there was water running out of the right side. When the man brought me out of the east with a, with a line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits. And he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. He measured 1,000 cubits with another 1,000 feet. And he measured, and the water came up to my knees. He measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the water, and the water came up to my waist. He measured 1,000 more cubits and, and the river that, was, that I could not cross for the water was too deep in which, the, which we must swim, a river that could not be crossed. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? And he bought me and he returned me to the bank of the river. And when I returned there along the bank of the river were many trees on one side and the other. And he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down through the valley, enters the sea, and when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. 
got people in your life that are dying and God says let the river come take my river to them take the river of my love to them love people that don't deserve it love people that have never earned it come on give your life away and God will let the river wash over them everybody stand up on your feet with me please just lift your hands to the Lord say God I want the Holy Spirit come on don't be afraid of him say Lord I, I'm asking for the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit baptize me right now some of you are even afraid to do that because you're like what's that going to look like it just means that you want to jump in the river just baptize me so deep in your love that I can't even swim to the other side God I don't need a life jacket I don't need a life preserver I'm just going to trust you to guide my life not of my own ability God but of the spirit of the living God ask him to baptize you right now some of you I'm just going to tell you right now in your right there where you're at you're going to say Lord baptize me with the Holy Spirit and you're going to hear a sound inside of you the Holy Spirit is going to give you a sound and you just pray it it, it isn't going to be English it's not going to be your native tongue it's not going to be Spanish it's, it's, it's a sound inside of you and you begin to pray that it doesn't have to sound pretty it doesn't have to be for anybody this is between you and the Lord and right now I want you to say Lord baptize me in the Holy Spirit come on say it Lord baptize me in the Holy Spirit now just begin to pray come on pray everybody in the room come on jump, jump in the river I don't know what that is it, it, they'll take care of it they just jump in the river jump in the river give it to you Lord give it to you Lord Lord fill me baptize me baptize me in the Holy Spirit if everybody just put your hands on your belly please just put your hand that your belly is like like this is just like touching your spirit right here out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water in the name of Jesus we receive the Holy Spirit with fire. With fire. Holy Spirit. I challenge you to feel the heat from your hands on your belly right now. The fire of God. Now, everybody in the room, just pray in your prayer language. If you have your prayer language, just pray right there. You and the Holy Spirit. If you're watching online, pray in your prayer language right now. Just pray. Come on. Come on, let's go deeper with God. You say, well, I'm not sure I have a prayer language. Just pray in anything. Just don't pray in English. Just pray. You and the Lord. It's not about anybody around you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Yesterday, um, we did a wedding for uh, Nicole and Johnny. They got married yesterday, and I had the privilege of officiating their wedding. When the wedding finished, they had the cake reception out there, and they were all out there, and I just went back to my office to go over my sermon notes. I have Titus and Tegan, my granddaughter, my grandson here with me, and they were in here, and when they went to cut that cake, little Tegan said, Hallelujah. <laughs> I think she was wanting cake, but she was like, Hallelujah. And uh, I smiled, went back to my office, and I was sitting in my office, and I was reading over my notes, and I just began to, to cry. Because I want people to encounter the Holy Spirit. And that's just back there, Lord. We don't want to live in the natural. We don't want to respond the same old way. God, just move the people. Titus said, Pop, because Titus come running in, and he said, Pop, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm okay. So he climbed over to wipe my tears and just check on me, you know, and he said, Pop, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I had the privilege of explaining to my grandson the river of God. This is what God wants for all of us. He wants you guys to experience the love of God so much in your marriage, in your home, that your children are going, are you okay? What's wrong? What's wrong? No, it's the joy of the Lord. 
It's the joy of the Lord and God blesses them. Like, how long has it been, Joe? Don't let it go too long that you and Caden have an encounter with God. Don't let, it, don't let it go too long. You guys are engaged now and you're going to get married. But if you don't build it on an encounter with the Lord, what's going to be built on? Now that you're following Christ, there ought to be an encounter with you and your wife, with the Lord, so the people around you are going, what's different about you? What's changing about you? How come, how come you're not the same anymore? I had a guy tell me last night, he said, just in the last little bit, we've been going to one of your small groups. And he said, my wife and I don't even go to your church, but we go to this small group. And all of a sudden we find ourselves just wanting more of God. And my neighbors came over to us and, and they said, oh yeah, you guys are Jesus freaks now. He goes, that offended me. I said, it ought to bring you so much joy. It ought to bring you so much joy that they're seeing a change in your life. How long has it been since you and your family? Come on, I'll speak to all the men in the room. How long has it been since you led them in a spiritual thing? How about having communion in your house with just you and your children? And you open the Bibles and begin to teach them about the encounter with Jesus and the brokenness of his life and the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of their sins. Just speaking to the men, saying, look here, we have a responsibility to put the... You grandparents, you have a responsibility. Some of you are so stinking afraid of your sons and your daughters that they're going to get offended. You won't even talk to your grandkids about the Lord. Stop. Who cares if they get offended? You didn't, you didn't raise them that way. Just tell them about Jesus. Pray over them. Labor over them in prayer one night and just see what happens. Because if you have an encounter with Jesus, they will too. Amen? Come on. Brennan, let him have it. Let him have it. Let Brady have it. Just get in there. He told me the other day, he said, I got, I got saved. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost too. That's what he told me. That's awesome, man. Come on, just ask God for an encounter this week. Come on. God, give me an encounter this week. God, take me out of this, this, this routine of Christianity. Baptize me fresh and anew in the power of the Holy Spirit calls me to be a better husband, calls me to be a better father, Lord, calls me a better, to be a better pastor for the sheep, Lord. Take our church to the river. Take us to the river, God. Let us move to the mission field of this world. We are the teachers. They are the students. Jesus, we give you our lives. We love you. We thank you. Come on, let's worship the Lord just for a minute before we go. Everybody just lift your hands to the Lord. If you received your prayer language, just lift your hands right now. Say, you know what? I did. I, I spoke in one word or one syllable or I prayed in a prayer language. Just lift your hands and thank you for the encounter with the Holy Spirit today. Thank you, Jesus.